The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Next, we have uh, Tom Jaw from is a principal and technical director at DCI Engineers in Seattle. He's going to do a talk on the study of increase in shear demand in buildings and performance-based design as compared to code level demands, which we all know is a big hot topic. All right. Good afternoon. Um, I want to talk about uh, this topics uh, uh, about uh, shear demand, where between performance-based design and code level design. I'll give some background on why I wanted to study this. All right, so we are more or less more familiar with the, the building design department in the code right now. So if you are, have a concrete shear wall design in high sensing zones, if you are taller than 240 feet, you will have to do performance-based design. The, uh, the reason for people to do performance design basically is because it's yield more economical design in comparison to dual systems or in pure moment frame systems. So the in high system museum, particularly in the west coast of the US, the performance design is very uh, preferred method. So in CD Seattle, um, performance space design allowed for building taller than 240 feet, but it's also uh, for any design, it has to also to meet the full code design requirements, which means you have to use R equal to five or six to design the buildings uh, under the conventional method. And then, then you go through performance-based design. So because of that, the, in, in the, uh, but that's not necessarily always the case for other jurisdictions. So some jurisdictions allow you to do performance-based design without doing the code level designs. You may do a service level earthquake analysis, but not necessarily do code level. So, but city Seattle require that. Because of that, then there's a lot of data collected at the city. Um, the, they noticed that the performance-based design would predict a much, sheer, a much higher shear demand for concrete shear wall structures, particularly for tall buildings. Uh, and it's not the, the difference between the uh, MCE's maximum considered earthquake versus uh, the design-based level earthquake that's uh, two-thirds MCE is that 1.5%. If 50% uh, more is expected. But the results often find is, is, is a factor of three or more. So that's why it caused the, the, uh, some concerns. Because that, the city of Seattle uh, in 2016 started to require for any building taller than 160 feet to, be, to use an um, additional shear strength application factor of 2.5 equivalent pixel omega using overstrength factor. So this caused a lot of heartburns for engineers because engineers used to be designed for building between 160 and 240. You can just use code levels, be it you need to meet some uh, regular requirement torsion in particular. So uh, there's, uh, and also there's no clear guidelines for when you, you increase, the, um, uh, increase the shear demand, what is the capacity you should pro pro to use particular at the code level design. So that's triggered my, my, my study. So I, what I, so there are two questions naturally come. One is that, is the shear demand increase appropriate for building between 160 feet and 240 feet? It's not right now required by SE 710, but only required by city of Seattle. And second is how to determine the shear capacity if you use, if you increase the shear by 2.5, right? So, um, we know for performance design, we know the shear force is higher, but in performance design, we often use the um, uh, strength reductor factor 1.0. We also, we also use uh, the um, expected material properties, not specified material properties. That's also some huge difference, right? So how do you evaluate all the different parameters and, uh, and have a, some kind of a reasonable recommendations to go 
for buildings uh, in, that, in, in that range. So my study really is very narrow. It's between two, 160 feet and 240 feet uh, to see if the city of Seattle's recommendation is appropriate or uh, it's uh, reasonable. So I took two buildings. The building A is a uh, right at 240 feet. The building B is a um, is 159 feet, so it's a little bit less than 160 feet. So building A in city Seattle, because it's 240 feet, would require you to apply for fee factor 2.5, basically increase your shear wall, uh, shear demand by factor 2.5. Some basic design uh, information. Both building is uh, went through the uh, co-level design, so did not go through a performance design, so that's why we have a lot of data collect here. So building A, building height 240 feet, we're in seismic design category D. Crack sections, uh, we use the wall 70%. We know that a lot of people design walls for 50%. This is a 70%. 70% will be actually have higher core level shear demand because it's stiffer walls. The link beam is uh, pretty typical, 15% to 20% represent the cracked concrete. Fundamental pier for ERF, for equivalent lateral force method versus the, the dynamic uh, method, uh, the mode uh, uh, response spectral method, you can see the difference is quite big. Because of that, the base shear has to, can be scaled up. In this case, it's scaled about 85% of the ERF. Total base shear is about 5% of building weight. Concrete strength, 8,000. The concrete strength reduction factor, um, here we picked 0.75. For both building A and building B, Interestingly, for both building A, building B, because if at the code level, because the wall piers are uh, in the link beam direction, because this wall piers is shorter than the typical story height, so the redundancy factor 1.3 would apply for both buildings. But in this case, because we're applying the 2.5, we're not re applying for 1.3 for sure. And the building B is 159 feet, and all the parameters are similar. The difference is that it's about 5% of the building weight, design concrete strength 7,000. Uh, in this case, we use a shear strength reduction factor of 0.6, because it's, a, it's under ACI, it's a, it's a shear, shear driven building. Uh, we use the redundancy factor 1.3. Because that link beam, because a couple of the wall directions. Very interesting. Remember that point, and we'll see certain results to show if that is justified or not, the redundancy factor 1.3. The shear amplification factor 2.5 is not applied in this case because it's shorter than 160 feet. So here's some uh, summary of the uh, both buildings. I just want to. So it's basically, we're saying the building A, the aspect ratio, the height to uh, wall length is about 8 to 10. The building B is about five to six. It's pretty common for that building high school. This is uh, the elastic analysis, basic code level analysis. The black dot line is the, um, is the shear demand under the code based on uh, spectral analysis, dynamic analysis. The blue line is the shear reinforcement provided, basically your rebars, your concrete strengths, and based on ACI to determine that that's, that's uh, this is the, the total story shear to the distribution. But if you look at the, so this is the wall pier shear distribution. So this is a P1, this is a P4, this is a, this is a basic couple of the walls. You can see the shear distribution over the height, fairly uniform. So if you look at the next, the, the, the other direction, that's a solid wall. You see the shear distribution is much amplified at the lower base. So we'll say the solid wall is more like a wall shear for distribution. This is not, this is actually pretty typical for a solid wall. But for a couple of the walls, it's more look like a moment frame because it's more uniform. So this is elastic analysis. We don't know, we can show you the nonlinear time history analysis that actually have the same patterns. It's very inter interesting. So this is the other wall piers, um, basically the same, 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 same pattern. You can see fairly uniform, the demand, the shear demand. This is the building A. For building B, we designed the, the reason that uh, the shear reinforcement is uniform straight up like this is because we 
we find out the minimum share reinforcement, the 2%, uh, the, the, the 0.02, uh, the, the, the percent is, it, is already providing enough share, share capacity for, for this particular building. So it's based on minimum share reinforcement, not based on share demand. So again, this is a total story, story share. And this is the uh, couple of the wall directions. And this is the uh, non coupled wall directions. So this is a logic analysis. <coughs> then we run both buildings through nonlinear time history analysis, used uh, some of the um, uh, earthquake motion record we used for some taller buildings. Uh, we didn't just, just uh, we just borrowed those records. So there are four of them are deep subduction known uh, ground motions, three uh, shallow crustal. Earthquake. This is a fairly representative in the Seattle area, so it's, it's, it's true uh, local ground motion and ground. Uh, the, the building is also designed based on local conditions. So this is just ground motion. This is the um, this is the um, spectrum, maximum spectrum, and the average of the seven records. We use seven records. So for performance three D modeling, it is fairly typical. There's nothing. Um, Nonlinear model for the core walls elements and for the basement walls diaphragm mostly elastic and with some proper crack section assumptions. Uh, so crack section is based on ASE 41. The damping is uh, is only two percent for model damping and 0.2 percent for relay damping. PT auto effect included. Uh, to do a, com a comparison, we define M uh, VMCE representing the nonlinear shear demand based on MCE level earthquake. So we call it maximum shear demand shear walls. Based on the upper bound model to capture the maximum shear demand, which means in your elastic elements, so we are assuming the base is more rigid, so that gives you more um, uh, demand to the shear force. And then we use the mean plus the uh, um, sigma and uh, yeah, as, as uh, representative of the maximum shear demand for nonlinear analysis. For the V expect, that means the, the, uh, the V, capa uh, the v um, capacity based on expected material strengths. So typical material strengths used here. So it's fairly typical and the strength reduction used of V1.1 is fairly typical uh, parameters we use for performance speed design. So based on those, the comparison look like this. This is the building A, total storage here. You can see this building run is basically to meet the, the, the red line. The dot line is the 2.5. It's uh, amplified by 2.5. The red line is actually the nonlinear time history analysis results. The blue line is the share of reinforcement provided based on original design. So in this case, it looks like a, um, generally it, 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 it passed. It's, it, it's, it's adequate. Even though the dynamic is higher, but it still would provide enough steel shear reinforcement. Uh, this is uh, looking more into details of each wall. This first uh, look, this is a couple of the walls. Oh, okay, so this is this is in wall piers. Okay, so this is in the couple of the wall direction P1 and P4. You can see it's fairly uh, similar, and uh, so it's fairly uniform uh, up and down. <coughs> now this is the the solid wall direction, and you can see that the base is coming out quite a bit more, uh, but in this case, we're, we're more or less meet the demand. So this red is the demand, the blue is shear reinforcement provided. Again, this is a wall, couple of the directions. So basically, what I'm, this is what I'm saying. So elastic predicted a more uniform distribution over the highs. The long linear analysis repeated <coughs> that. So, but not in the solid wall directions. Uh, this is for building B. Building B, because we use the minimum shear reinforcement, we didn't really design for the, the uh, redundancy factor. So it's, uh, the, the demand is over the, the reinforcement a bit. And the solid wall design by, by quite a bit. But it pretty, because we use the minimum reinforcement, it can be easily uh, modified if we used uh, some, um, to, to meet the um, dynamic uh, requirement. So if a shear reinforcement provide like this, for example, it's pretty easy to, because 
this wall was only the sheer reinforcement probably is number six that uh, 12 inch assembly is really light. So it can be easily uh, uh, increased to meet that demand. So this is just showing if we do a modified. Uh, observations and discussions. So, so this comparison confirmed the past observations. The performance based design always predicts a higher share demand. And it's almost uh, in, in the range of three or more. So it's much greater than the difference between the MCEs and the DEs, design based or earthquake, right? So the difference is supposed to be 1.5, but, but the, the actual analysis shows constantly on the shear demand to the shear walls is three or more. So uh, the second uh, conclusion will be using the Omega 5 2.5 to estimate the shear demand application at the code levels is a reasonable lower bound design value. I think it's, it's appropriate. And it, it also is rational to, to use uh, redundancy factor 1.0 when you use 2.5. You don't use 1.3 times 2.5, then you will use the 3 point something at the code level. We think that's too conservative. We think you can use 1.0 just uh, if you use omega 2.5. Uh, we also think it's uh, proper to use uh, 3.75 uh, for nominal material properties when you design at the code levels, and you do not need to use 0.6. Uh, you, uh, using phi equal to 1.0 at core level power too, too uh, aggressive. Nonlinear analysis also uh, results indicate the less shear demand implication for coupled walls, particularly in comparison to non-coupled walls. This is uh, um, the only two building we, we, we run, but uh, we think we see this uh, trend uh, coupled in, uh, in many other studies as well. So that's why we think because the link beam in elastic energy dissipations may help, and also the natural distributions, more like moment frames, distribute the systems versus a constant systems at the base of the building, all contribute to that conclusions. I think that's why there's a study to increase the R factor for a linked beam uh, shear walls uh, compared to conventional shear walls. That's concluded my presentation. Right, we have time for some questions. Sure. Question, Tom. Uh, now, building A reminds me is the one, the shorter building, right? Building A is taller building, 240 feet. So the amplification were higher than the which building? <laughs> confused the taller building or the shorter building? The taller building used 2.5. The shorter building only used you know, 1.5. The nonlinear analysis when you showed the graphs, the nonlinear, uh, yeah, yeah, building A is the taller building. A was fine, but B, the shorter building was worse, right? That's right, because the shorter building did not design for 2.5. Okay, shorter right. building only designed, not only not designed, but did not design for omega, for the redundant factor either, because it's controlled by the minimum shear reinforcement. So you wonder if that's the trend all the way down to like a five-story building? Uh, probably we are. So that's, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's really the dilemma. We're, 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 we're going with this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably right. we can find a ten-star building, five-star building, a similar trend that may may happen. So, um, so I, I, I'm a little afraid to find that out. So, <laughs> so then then what? <laughs> yeah. Thank you.